My Papaji was a man of principles. He taught us to respect all mankind, race, color, creed, and religion. I think I must go back to my childhood to recall certain very vivid memories of him. And I remember he was being moved from one place to another in India, where he was detained and also imprisoned for his political activities. I think I would be around three to four year old at that time. And uh, his train stopped at Delhi station. And when I saw him, I started crying. And when I started crying, there were a lot of Askaris around him. I says, Kaka, what he was trying to say is, why, why are you crying? Your father is totally, uh, is not afraid of anything. And uh, why should you be crying? And I think that is my first memory, that this father of mine, who was being moved from one place to another, had the guts to stand for whatever he believed in. When my father was born, there was only my grandmother. And they say, it is written in my grandfather's small history, they did not have a single pie, even to get milk and various other little things when the, it was born. So he was born in abject poverty. That's one thing. The second thing is, he was left behind. My grandfather came into this country in 1920. My father would be about seven years old when he was left behind in the village. Now after that, he came here in 1927. He was about 14 years old then. But those characters were already inbuilt with him because when he finished his O level, I think he had already made up his mind that he is going to work at that time into you can call it trade union movement for others' right. I think that is what he wanted to do all his life. He wanted to fight for others' right without any benefit to himself. In 1973, when he died, I wrote an obituary for a local newspaper. So that was really my very first real contact with Makhan Singh as such. However, while researching, I kept coming up across the name of Makhan Singh as a great freedom fighter uh, in Kenya. Uh, and I was, became more and more intrigued that so little was really known about him as a person, as a man, as a family man. Makhan Singh, when he finished his schooling, he joined the printing press that his father had established in 1933, the Khalsa Printing Press. And there he interacted with other workers and printers and people who worked in the trade. And my guess is that he learned a lot about workers' problems and colonial situations in Kenya at that time. There was quite a strong left-leading ideology that was being expounded here. Also, there were many left leaning people in Kenya, people like Ishar Das, the revolutionaries of the Ghadar party who were settled here and who actually worked with Makan Singh. He grew up in that kind of atmosphere and uh, he must have imbibed a lot of that revolutionary fervor at that time. What I know about Makan Singh, he was a very great trade unionist. He started joining work in the labor movement when he was working with his father on a newspaper. And he agitated for workers' rights. Despite he was working for his father, he didn't care. He looked at this, how other employees were being used and he, he, he found it was not fair. So he, he from there, he, he agitated the rights of the workers and he joined the labor movement because that was the time during the colonial days when trade unions were coming up agitating for the freedom of workers. Marcus have heard of his speeches when he was a leader, when he talked in the TVs, when he talked in the press, when he talked in the newspapers. He was a great man. I admired his vision. 
and the history we are put, the printing and come up with, we shall not forget because we are on the foundation put up by late Makan Singh. The most important thing Makan Singh did for Kenya is to enlighten Kenyans to know their rights. Workers didn't know their rights. They were being frustrated, get low paid, work many hours, which Ms. Mackensen stood for. And he fought hard to make sure that workers can work eight hours, nine hours, eight hours, and remove the long hours people are working, create over time, improve the welfare of workers. So a lot of things Mackensen did for the workers which cannot be forgotten. There are several aspects to, uh, uh, to Mackensen. First of all, I think he's best known as the founder of the trade union movement in Kenya. Uh, until he came on the scene, workers used to have their odd strikes and whatever, but there was no organized trade union movement. It is he who started it and gave it impetus. More than that even, he was able to understand the importance of the workers participation in the anti-colonial movement. So he linked trade union uh, matters to politics. And he said that it is the workers who would defeat the colonialists in Kenya. And that is exactly how it happened because the Mau Mau struggle and all had as its leadership, trade union leaders. So I have had him talk of different subjects, the politics at the Kalori Social Hall, the meetings at the Pumwan Memorial Hall, Kiburi House. He was talking about the problems of the workers, particularly racial discrimination, segregation, Calabar. He talked about people at low level were given low wages when the top level, particularly the Europeans, were given big money. And I remember also Makan Singh was saying, we had two Nairobis. One Nairobi, poor Nairobi for Africans and for Europeans. And it was so because that was happened, because the areas were segregated. A European was sitting, eating in the hotels, which Asian and African could not go. They were buying shops where the African were restricted to, to buy. And it was written there on the, on the door. Europeans only, African and dogs not allowed. So African were not even were to be able to even to go closer. Asian were owner of the shops, and European were the customers. And Asian were not allowed to buy in those Europeans only. So there was this kind of racial discrimination which Mackenzie was talking about. Early 1950, I remember I attended Kenyatta's meetings. At the door that we are here, that was the entrance of the Mark and Singh. The Carolinian Social Hall was the best place for the political meetings. This is the platform where the leaders used to, to be when the other members now are listening to their speeches. It was also here on that day, the 23rd April 1950. The Mark and Singh passed a resolution which was uh, supported by Fred Kupai that East African should be independent as soon as possible. Uh, when Mark and Singh made the statement, Uhuru Sasa, what were the people feeling? People felt, felt, felt very happy because they had never heard about the Uhuru Sasa for East Africa. They had been only talking about of Kenya. But now Makansing has come with the wider East Africa. Later, Makansing had now organized another meeting here. This was now to object Nairobi being given a charter. And uh, Makansing and Fred Kubai, Kagia and the rest now were leading the trade unions, educating the workers not to accept uh, the, the gifts the feasts that were to be given, and the celebration. And thereafter, the Mark and Singh and the friend Kubai were arrested. And uh, Kubai was taken to court. Mark and Singh was deported.
they declared the general strike of Nairobi. It was after that general strike, Nawaka started seeing the benefits of the trade unions because they had the wage increases, they had the better terms and the condition of service being improved. Workers started seeing the fruits of mercantile thereafter and trade unions were also recognized. But what he did in those two or three years that I saw him in 48, 49, were totally amazing. Almost single-handed, he brought the, the trade union movement on a, on a, on a platform that he, it could carry it forward. And he never, ever expected anything in return. Never. At that time, it is not just trade union activity that he was involved. He was involved in the actual politics of the country. And I think he was amongst the first persons to use. He said, I want to stop this argument. I want Uhuru Sasa. And I think these were the words he used in Kalonani very famous speech, which was in 1950 or thereabout. And he was arrested within two weeks after that thing. Makan Singh was a very, very major threat to the British colonialists, more so than perhaps any other leader in Kenya at that time. And he became extremely difficult uh, to deal with. So he had to be really, really isolated. And that's what the British did. With that uh, very stage-managed trial which they held in Neary, they detained him and they virtually decided to forget about him. The most hurtful feelings I still have, and when I remember them, they form a very dark, thick cloud over me. That is the morning when he was arrested. I can still see him being taken away by two white policemen flanked on either side in a black car which was parked on the footpath along Park Road across from a house while I was clinging to my BBG's leg. Being a child, I could not understand what was going on, that my papaji was being taken away from me. It was a very traumatic episode. I remember I met Makan Singh when we were flown to uh, Lokitang from Kitale. We saw an Asian and we said to ourselves, now who is this man? I think it was Kenyatta who recognized him. Say, Miss Makan Singh. Oh, so we were just wondering, this is where he hid him from the public. Because for four years, three, four years, oh, we had not heard anything about it about him. Some even said he might have been sent back to India or he might have uh, been silenced somehow. And, then, uh, oh, later on, we quickly found out that it was Makan Singh. And uh, he did this solidarity. Never give up. Makan Singh was devoted and detained in 1950, and he was sent to Lokitong in the Northern Frontier District. In 1952 to 3, the Kafanguria 6 trial took place, and Kafanguria 6 was then imprisoned in Lokitong. So the story is that it was a hilly sort of area. So they were on one side, and across the gully, these six, they saw this bearded turban Asian, gesticulating with both hands, almost like showing solidarity. And he started sending them copies of his East African standard, which he used to get from the police lines. And in it, he would write small notes, and they began to communicate. But it didn't last long, because the colonials got onto it. And within a, about two weeks, Makan Singh was then moved on to Maralal. And from then on, whenever Jomo Kenyatta was moved to Maralal, Makan Singh was moved to Dol Dol. But they were not allowed anymore to meet together. As if that was not enough. They were so frustrated that they even decided to persecute him while he was there. 
So, in fact, one of the DOs said to uh, Makan Singh that if we cannot prosecute you, at least we can persecute you. They made difficulties for him every step of the way. Everything that he wrote was censored. Everything that he received was censored. By rights, his family should have been allowed to visit him regularly and live with him. They didn't let him meet his son for many, many years until he, he left for his further studies in India. And finally then, he got to meet his son. In 1957, his mother, who had been very ill, passed away. And a request was made that he should at least attend the cremation. But he was absolutely refused to go down to Nairobi for that. Jomo Kenyatta was released in uh, August 1961. Pio Gama Finto was released uh, three years earlier. But Makan Singh was not released till October 1961. He was the last detainee to be released. Makan Singh came out of uh, detention in 1961. Um, we had great hopes uh, in Kenya, not just for Makan Singh, but for a whole new Kenya that would be a country that would benefit the people of Kenya. However, very soon we found that the very people who had been his one-time comrades, people who had led the struggle, had begun to change their colors. And Western interests had come in. The colonialists had selected various leaders who were useful to them and done away with others. And so that you found that Makan Singh was, became part of that group of people who were really no more welcome in the new Kenya. At the time of our release, some of the colleagues who pretended to be our friends became the, uh, our bitter enemies. You see, with uh, Makan Singh being a nation who uh, was expected to be quiet and uh, law-abiding, even if he was not law-abiding, but keep off from politics, they, they had to be suppressed that way. While we people, uh, some of us, came out asked for positions and were given positions. There was a direct appeal to us not to take people or, or rely on people like Makan Singh because he was a leftist. I remember that. They labeled him a leftist. When we were at Karoleni, Mark and Singh said, if they call me a communist, I am a communist. But he was not a communist by, by the way that the Europeans used to say that he was a communist. He was extremely highly principled. I mean, the type of principle that you only find in people like Gandhi, maybe Mandela, because they are the type of people who would just not listen to anything outside what they believe in. When he came back to Nairobi, where he's released, the next morning he was going to give a press interview. And he discussed with me. He says, in Pala, I'm tomorrow I'm going to be interviewed. And one of the questions they are going to ask me 
is that are you a communist or not a communist? And we discussed it. And the next morning, it's true, he said that I was a communist, I am a communist, and I shall remain a communist. I think it was that thing that Kenyatta and him, they changed their roots. Because people like Makhan Singh, they were not politicians. They were great nationalists. And the great nationalists don't change their path. So Makhan Singh did not change, but other world changed. And therefore, he had to pay a price for that thing. Because after independence, when he was released, he was not taken back into trade unionism. He was not taken back into politics. He was not given any work to do substantially or whatever. So therefore, he spent most of his time in writing the history of the trade union movement. He finished both his volumes. Makhan Singh, as I said, increasingly became sidelined and um, becoming a player in history. He really turned now to just recording history and that's when he started writing the history of the trade union movement. Uh, so he was less and less uh, in the public eye. Sure, we were in a Kenya at that time where all our heroes were forgotten. Uh, our, all our great patriots were not remembered by the leadership of this country. But no, the people of Kenya have never forgotten Makhan Singh. History has to be written about the previous leaders, Makhan Singh being the leading star in those past leaders for the new leadership to have a vision out of those leadership, to understand why they fought, why they called a strike, why they stood up for other people, why they gave their life, because they gave their life, see, for others. The short period that I spent in Nairobi after his release, not once did I hear him complain or even mention anything about not being given the recognition by the current ruling government. Whenever anyone raised this issue, his answer was, I did the work not for receiving any rewards. A totally selfless, unmaterialistic person. However, he did become very quiet and withdrawn. His passing away devastated me, as that is when it dawned upon me that my communication with my father will always stay unfinished.